Hi everyone, welcome back to Extra Credit, and this is our 18th episode on the history of Rome. So last time we saw how the Roman world was turned upside down when the Emperor Constantine became a Christian in the year 312 AD. But the brief golden age ushered in by Constantine was really the last good times for Rome, because by this point in its history in the 300s, after standing firm for almost a thousand years, the Roman Empire was truly starting to fall apart. As a case in point, the last two centuries of Roman history that we're going to look at in these last couple of episodes were so filled with chaos and calamity that barely ten years could go by at a time without some kind of major rebellion, disaster, civil war, or all of the above. But even though the empire itself was slowly staggering towards its deathbed, something inside of it was still alive growing, feeding on the empire for life, getting ready to take over its body and burst out from its corpse in a gr Wait, is this the scene from Alien? Oh no, it's the church. It's the church, everybody. But in all seriousness, one of the great questions of Roman history is how does the Christian church, which starts as this underground club of misfits being fed to lions, eventually get to the place where not only does it outlast the Roman Empire, but actually ends up replacing the Roman Empire as the dominant power in Europe for centuries to come. You see, for 300 years by this point, Christianity had been slowly transforming the empire with millions of regular Romans abandoning their faith in the old Greek and Roman gods and converting to the new faith in Jesus Christ. As we saw last time, this trend was given a really big boost by Constantine himself, who became a Christian in the year 312 AD, but the deal was really sealed in 380 AD when the Emperor Theodosius I officially declared that Catholic Christianity was now the only true religion in the Roman Empire, and ten years later made it illegal to worship the Greek and Roman gods. But we're getting ahead of ourselves here. After all, the road to this point wasn't exactly smooth, and things definitely got hairy at times. No, no, not, not that kind of hairy. Yeah, like, complicated. So today we'll review the top three trends that took place in the evolution of the Christian church from awkward new guy who sits alone at lunch to all-star captain of the varsity football team. The first key trend was settling doctrine. Now, doctrine is just a fancy word that means the official beliefs and teachings of the church. And yes, grade eights, it's a fancy word because even though it's only got two syllables, be honest, you didn't know what it meant. You see, early on in Christian history, a lot of hard work had to be done to figure out what exactly it was that Christians believed and what the Bible taught. Now, there were a lot of hard questions, and pretty much everything I'm going to say in the next minute or so is grossly oversimplified, so please forgive me, Professor Dean. But the most crucial question of all had to do with the identity of Jesus Christ himself. You see, it was very clear to Christians that Jesus had a very special relationship with God the Father, but the exact nature of that relationship was a source of much disagreement. More specifically, the question that had to be settled was whether Jesus was simply a man who was like God, or was he God who took on the disciples? skies of a man, or somehow in a mystery was he both fully God and fully man at the same time. And it was to decide this question that in the year 325 AD, our good old friend the Emperor Constantine called the Great Potluck at the city of Nicaea to determine- wait. Okay, so apparently it was actually the Council of Nicaea, not the potluck, but it really doesn't make much difference because we all know that no business gets done in the church without at least four kinds of meatballs present and that amazing jello salad stuff, which is definitely not a salad, but is still awesome. Anyhow, the Council of Nicaea was able to settle the question of Jesus' identity once and for all, thus giving us the doctrine of the Trinity, which has been making heads explode ever since. In other news from Nicaea, the Council managed to set a date for Easter that everybody could agree upon, drafted a uni universal set of beliefs called the Nicene Creed, which is still recited in many churches today, and Santa Claus slapped a priest in the face. No, actually, you can look it up. But at the same time that priests and bishops were arguing with each other over plates of meatballs and jello salad, another key trend happening in the growth of the church was the transformation of the church into an organization with real political power. You see, in its earliest days, the church had basically been an underground organization meeting in people's homes whose main two goals were A, love God and live according to the Bible, and B, avoid being fed to lions if possible. But as time went by and emperors themselves became 
became Christians and began to sponsor and favor the church, the church underwent an incredible rags-to-riches transformation that left it completely unrecognizable and gave it massive influence that it had never had before. One outward symbol of this transformation was that believers started to build actual church buildings with wealthy Christians going out of their way to pay for more and more extravagant and expensive houses of worship. For example, the Emperor Constantine's own mother Helena built an enormous church right over the top of the tomb of Jesus called the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which I have personally visited and I can say that despite all of its beauty, I was disappointed to find that there was no free coffee bar. But much more important than the buildings themselves were the systems of power structure that the church was putting into place modeled on the Romans' own systems of government. You see, just like the Romans had their own systems and structures of government in which governors reported to higher officials and those higher officials reported to the emperor, the church started to mimic this with local priests reporting to bishops, bishops reporting to archbishops, and archbishops reporting to the guy at the very top, the pope who is basically an emperor with a way cooler hat. On top of this, the church even copied the physical layout of Roman government using something called the diocese system. The idea here was that in the later empire, the Roman government took all of their provinces and lumped them together into larger groups, each of which was called a diocese. Each of these dioceses was overseen by a Roman governor, but when the Roman Empire fell, the church officials still remained in place, so now bishops and archbishops were the ones in charge of those dioceses. Or to use a modern analogy, it's kind of like the Roman Empire had had a pretty sweet parking spot for a thousand years, and when it finally pulled out, the Pope Mobile just happened to come by and was like, hey, sweet, free parking spot. Now, this may sound a little bit boring, and it is maybe a little bit boring, but the end result of all this was that once the Roman Empire was gone, the church still remained to provide order, structure, and leadership for all of Europe, modeled on the Roman system. As if this wasn't enough, Christian emperors also favored the church by exempting the church from paying taxes and by allowing the church to use its own separate legal system from the regular one used by Romans. All of which combined to give the church incredible prestige, wealth, and power. In other words, all the stuff that God wants us to have, right? I mean, that's, that's in there somewhere, right? But seriously, it was exactly because the church was gaining so much prestige, wealth, and power that many Christians started to think that the church might actually be losing its way. After all, it was Jesus himself who had said that in the kingdom of heaven, the first shall be last and the last shall be first, and whoever wants to be the greatest should become the servant of all. This, together with the fact that Jesus had also spent time railing against the wealthy and powerful, and the fact that his followers were called to give up their possessions, made things more than a little awkward, especially when your church buildings looked like this. Which is why the final trend we're going to discuss today is so beautiful by comparison, the growth of charity. Charity simply means doing acts of service and love towards those who are less fortunate, which in the Roman Empire was a lot of people. See, as much as watching this channel makes you all want to go back and live in the past, the reality is that the ancient world could actually be a pretty crummy place to live a lot of the time. There was no welfare system for the poor, slavery was widespread, disease was often incurable, famine and starvation could be a regular part of life, and parents with too many mouths to feed could often end up abandoning their own babies on the roadside to die. And it was in this darkness that the light of the church shone brightest. Many early Christians took seriously the Bible's command to love your neighbor as yourself and to care for orphans, the sick, the widows, the poor. Thus, when plague struck, it was Christians who stayed around to care for the sick and dying, even while other Romans fled for the hills. When widows couldn't feed themselves, it was Christians who handed out bread. And when babies were wailing by the roadside, left to die by their own parents, it was Christians who would come along, pick them up, and give them a place in their hearts and homes. In fact, even non-Christian historians like Tom Holland have written whole books about... No, not, not that Tom Holland. Yeah, the cool historian one. As I was saying, even non-Christian historians like Tom Holland have written whole books about the fact that the most important values in our modern society, the things we take for granted about caring for the poor, defending the weak, protecting the vulnerable, even the idea of human rights itself, are all fundamentally Christian concepts that were birthed into history by the church. Now, none of this is to deny the fact that the church would also go on to do evil as well, but the point is that the cure for that evil always came from inside the church, as godly women and men rose up to remind the believers around them of their true values of love, sacrifice, and service. 
But at the end of the day, all of these trends combined to form the church into a united social and political powerhouse that would go on to outlast and, as we said earlier, even replace the Roman Empire itself. And as we'll see in our final two episodes, even as Germanic invaders poured over the empire's borders and hacked the empire to pieces, the church remained strong, like a thousand candles burning in the darkness of Europe, keeping alive the flame of Western civilization, which includes Jello salad. Hey everybody, thanks for watching. We are getting very near to the end of our series on ancient Rome, so hopefully you're still enjoying it and still sticking with it so far. Your challenge for this week is to look up that whole thing about Santa Claus slapping a priest in the face and actually see what happened there. It's one of the more kind of crazy moments from history. As always, keep fit, have fun, read a book, play outside. Be sure to tune in next time, and we'll see you later.